Welcome to Author Author, my name is Sven Michael Davison and today I have a return of Carla King and she'll be talking about her travel book American Borders, how she basically became one of the first woman bloggers uh, on the internet and also uh, how she got her first Russian URL motorcycle. So if you haven't already, please subscribe and here we go. Something happened at the writers conference was I also met Alan Noren and he was with a company called O'Reilly and Associates. And if you're in technology, you probably know Tim O'Reilly, computer book publisher. And they were doing something called the global network navigator on this thing called the World Wide Web. And what they thought they would do is send uh, travel writers out to have their adventures and they could report back in real time to a audience who was on the internet. And so he, he did a presentation there and he had to explain what the internet was and what the World Wide Web was and what a wow. website was. 1994, okay. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's that long ago. And he made that presentation and then I won the award and he came and he said, you know, I was talking about that thing that we're doing. He goes, do you know anything about FTP or something? I'm like, I'm a technical writer. <laughs> I know everything about computers and, you know, modems wow. and things. And he goes, you're hired. My father's friend Chuck saw this ad for a Russian sidecar motorcycle in a motorcycle magazine. It was really a description of a new company that was forming. So this guy, Bob Gerrand, in uh, Seattle, had gone to Russia, had seen these motorcycles and thought, hmm, he was a serial entrepreneur, thought, hmm, I'm going to maybe see if I could bring these bikes back and sell them as novelty motorcycles. And so he did. And so I wrote to him, again, pre-internet, and I said, I'm a journalist. I have this job writing for the internet. If you want some publicity, I'd love to talk about riding this motorcycle. And he got the letter and he called me up and he said, this sounds like so much fun. He goes, there's just one problem. I don't know if the motorcycle is going to run for 500 miles or 5,000 miles, but it's certainly not going to run for more than 5,000 miles. These things are made in Russia. They're very sloppily put together. They're based on a 1938 BMW, but uh, China and Russia have been making them since the 40s. And wow. yeah. <laughs> this was a new bike though, based on an old It was a design. new bike. It wasn't a high quality factory. So uh, I said, well, hey, you're in luck. I'm a motorcycle mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> they would get the motorcycles from Russia and then they would rework them at the warehouse in Bellingham and then sell them. But all the motorcycles were coming back because they had so many problems. They had to put a year or two guarantee on them. So I got mine uh, and that was part of the deal. I got my own and I rode it back to Santa Cruz and oh my gosh, the reaction, because nobody had sidecar bikes back then. Yeah. And so it was just a hit. Now we call it now, uh, it's a Ural motorcycle, UDL. It's the Ural delay factor. <laughs> can't go anywhere. You got, you're at a gas station or a restaurant, people come and they're like, what's that? I mean, even still, you still see them, but people are so attracted to sidecar motorcycles. They're not somehow as threatening as two-wheeled motorcycles, right. you know, the easy rider cool factor. They're more like a ride at the fair. <laughs> And then me being a woman as well, people found me very approachable and I was like, okay, I'm going to get some good stories. It was awesome, awesome trip. So I sent back the dispatches every week. It did break down every 100 to 500 miles. I could either fix it myself and sometimes, for instance, in Canada, I needed a, a new generator. So I had it towed to the last town that I saw. Of course, I'm over the border, which is hard for mailing parts to because it has yeah. to go through customs. So I went back to the town and there was no hotel. There was no gas station, nothing. And somebody in town saw me and, and they said, oh, go take it to Gary's house. Gary will put you up. And sure enough, Gary he had a uh, Norton uh, in his garage or a Triumph or something in pieces. So everybody knew that Gary was working on this bike for a long time. So of course, that's where I would stay. So I had to stay there for four days waiting for my alternator to come in. I'm wrong, it's, it wasn't the alternator. It was the uh, side, it was oh, the right the side of the inner, right side of the engine that time. See, I get all these mixed up. I went through four alternators, four gas tanks, because there was a broken weld, one half of an engine. Oh, 
It was just a mess. But they took all that information back to the factory and changed the assembly line. Because these bikes in Russia don't go over 40 miles an hour. So I think the vibration of a 50 miles an hour plus was breaking the right hand side of the attach points. I ended up stacking a bunch of rubber washers on it and zip tying it down on that side. Uh, Gary, Gary's awesome. I cooked him dinner and you know, I actually helped him paint a wall of his house while I was waiting. And then when I got the engine, he invited all his friends over. They all had Harleys and they all drank beers and smoked joints while I replaced the <laughs> The only watch the didn't help you. They just they drank were and like, <laughs> I wish I could help. But I have no idea what to do. And they would say, what kind of screwdriver do you want? You know, and but basically it was just a movie to them. It was very entertaining. Yeah, they were I'm very sweet. I'm also wondering, was it metric? Was it, was it, what, what, what kind of? Oh, no. Um, no, no. It's just BMW standard okay stuff it yeah didn't know i was in canada but i wasn't using oh, i just meant the parts of the bike too and all the all the fittings and stuff yeah so you know, they were so. random nothing was um precise since shutters up the spines of the germans who <laughs> designed it but they're awesome bikes now i still have a great relationship with the company and i went from vienna to the sahara desert and back with one in uh, 1994 model i have another one now I lasted maybe six years without a girl. It was just one of those random finds. It was really cheap. It had been purchased for a television commercial and it sat in the lobby of an ad agency for 10 years. So it had 300 kilometers on it. And so I bought it for really cheap. They were really made to hold a sidecar. In fact, the fork system, they're called a Earl's forks. They're upside down forks is a stronger system. Because as you can imagine, the front wheel, you want a really sturdy front wheel when you're yeah. carrying, you know, whole thing on your left side or on your right side. Ask me anything about those bikes. Perfect. Sometimes I, I get caught and talk at one of these adventure rallies with somebody who's also a, a Ural nerd and we just alienate everyone around us. I actually wrote the uh, manual for, for them. I edited the manual for the English version. This first trip you took... Mm -hmm. That became uh, American Borders? That became the American Borders Motorcycle Diaries. And uh, yeah, it was done in 1995. And it didn't become a book until 2004. So I self-published it. Did you even try to go the traditional route? Or you just, you, you know, know just... I did. The motorcycle really scares people off because they think it's a book for motorcyclists. It doesn't have a wide enough market. I, I shouldn't have put myself on the motorcycle on the cover. I'm going to reissue this. This is the great thing about self-publishing too is that you have total control over your book and so yeah. no publisher has it it's not backlisted I can do whatever I want I can I found some edits that I want to do with it and uh, I won't put a motorcycle on the cover it's really -centric. the same audience as Cheryl Strayed's Wild or um, Eat Pray Love by yeah. Elizabeth Gilbert you know it's really in that style or you know any travel book really my audience <laughs> It's mostly male over 45. That's who the book sells to. The women that I have reached have read it reluctantly for some reason or other. They're, they've gotten it as a gift from their motorcycle riding boyfriend or they know me and they're going, wow, I was really surprised that I liked this even though it's about a motorcycle ride. Do you have to be a mountain climber to enjoy crack hours into Up thin in air? Yeah. or? Or a hiker to, for Cheryl Strayed Wild. The motorcycle is very alienating to people. Interesting. In the U.S., not in the not in Europe. Everybody's grandma rides a scooter there, right? Or yeah. A little motorcycle. There's no room in the roads. There's no use. room. Gas is expensive. And the women who have loved it really do enjoy learning. When I replaced the piston in Canada, I described what a piston does and you know how it squeezes the you know the whole air thing and Suck, and squeeze, people blow. <laughs> there's, there's a term that you, you know, yeah. remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was interesting too because I I read that part of the book to a audience at a reading and everybody started tittering because it's actually pretty sexy thrusting yeah. Yeah. and you know heat <laughs> and <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance right. there's a lot of <clears throat> engine descriptions there but it's all about quality and it's about how he's doing it and what what he's doing and why he's doing it and demonstrating you know what a shim is he's demonstrating that one little change 
whole can change the whole thing, right? And this applies not only to a machine, but to, to a person. Your spirit or your spirit, yeah. yeah. American Borders, how many miles did you put on this bike? Um, well, of course, the odometer broke, <laughs> okay. so I have to estimate at least 10,000 miles because I did go around America's borders and I went into Canada and Mexico. The point was to stay around the edges because I wanted to see what the borders looked like in America because they were so drastic in the 80s in Europe. You know, when I took the train from France to Germany, these big burly German guys in uniform would come and go actong and you know demand your passport and look at yeah. you and make you feel guilty for living and <laughs> you know that you were going to get thrown in jail any minute and then they give it back and you'd be like, oof, I need it again. <laughs> so different now. Life before the Euro, before the yeah. Yeah, European Union, it's pretty crazy. I remember the first time I motorcycled again through Europe and all of those roads, uh, the borders on the roads were just abandoned and opened. It was kind of eerie. It was it's nice. Wild. It's nice. I do miss the obvious cultural changes, the money changes. And borders are so interesting because oftentimes they have to do with a natural occurring, um, you know, a river or mm. mountain. And then people change. We're becoming homogenized now, but they they go from small and dark to tall and blonde in five minutes. They go from eating f French food to German food <laughs> in five minutes. And you're like, oh, I did love that. But I do love open borders. There weren't a lot of motorcycle girls around in those days. So you found a niche. I found a niche. So I was um, starting to write for all the magazines, Rider and Psych World. And then the internet happened. So Women Writers Now, which was a print magazine, became a web magazine and reached a lot more people. I had a very active blog. It didn't make a ton of money, so I was still doing a bunch of tech writing. Although I did start working for PC World, testing out wild new things like laptop computers <laughs> <laughs> and GPS units, bags and anything you can carry on a motorcycle. And then motorcycle apparel companies would give me gear. So I had this unmanageable closet full of pants and jackets and boots and gloves. I finally said, oh my gosh, I have to start saying no to this stuff because I have to review it all. I was uh, reviewing it on my website and on social media. Olympia Motorsports was, it just changed hands. They, they were my gear sponsor for a long time. I finally just chose one I liked. They were one of the first ones to make really specific gear for women. Okay. You know, not just men's gear in women's sizes, but with curves and, you know, things that we have that men don't. Yes. <laughs> so it was very difficult to fit into, into gear back then. And so I really appreciated that. And there's still very good women's gear maker although um, everybody all has almost caught up. They just, you know, wanted me to wear it, take pictures and tag them, you know, on social media. Social media, by the way, uh, do you have favorites, favorite channels? Because there's, there's thousands of channels. I'm now, seems, really but... on Facebook. Okay. I, I used to love Twitter. Let's talk about the writing process when you're travel writing. I think I would use Instagram today, but when I was in Morocco, for instance, I would tweet all the time, include a picture. Today, I'd probably Instagram all the time. I'd tweet all day long. Here's the Sarah Desert. Here's the Casbah. Here's the gas station. Here's the people I had tea with, right? Yeah. And then I would put a couple of Facebook posts together based on those, using photos as well. And then every couple, three days, I would sit down and I would compile all, the, all of them and then blog. Please subscribe so my dad can make more videos like this. Thank you.